Okay. Oh my god, I'm shaking like a leaf. I hope I can get this. I hope this is working. Please be working. Please be working. Okay, I gotta come down. Mark, wait until you see this. You're gonna have a frickin' canary. I, okay. All right. I am on my way up to the mountains to take some videotape uh, to show Lisa. And uh, it is December 27th, I believe. And I was, uh, I believe this is Jewel and, oh my God, I'm shaking. Saw something kind of out of the corner of my eye, uh, just skirting power lines. Uh, it uh, was tilted and straightened out and shot straight up into the air. And okay, let me get a better view of where I am, okay. Here's the power lines, and if you look, oh, where is it? Where'd it go? Son of a bitch, I hope I didn't lose it. Okay. Pull over. noticed it as I was turning in to uh, come up to Daniels Park. Just kind of caught out of the corner of my eye and didn't really pay much attention to it. But I really got a good glimpse of it as I was coming up the, there's a steep hill just right before you get up to the top of Daniels Park. And I could see the, uh, the light emanating from, the, from whatever this thing was on the ground, blinking on the ground. Um, it lit up the whole area. There it is. There's the thing that's been following me. Oh, shit, what is that? Yeah. Look at that, it's so close right here. Where did it come from? I don't know. The girl saw it. It wasn't the girl saw it. They said aliens had no idea what they were talking about. I can't tell you what this is. I can't, I have to convince myself of what I keep seeing. Thank God there's lots of other people that see it too.
day before yesterday when I had the sighting over the uh, over my work actually when my <laughs> boss first saw it um, that night um, something must have happened because I woke up in the morning and I had um, some indentations in my back and I didn't notice this actually uh, my sister noticed it but I noticed that I had uh, sores around my wrists like I was been roped or had been handcuffed or something okay. and this was it's healed amazingly fast Today's date. Eighth. Eighth of October. Mm -hmm. Eighth. 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 Yeah, it is. The eighth. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Personally, I think it's a little fishy that something happened, and uh, just the next day they come and replace all that siding.
Okay, today is May 5th, 2005. Um, we have problems with our speakers buzzing all the time. And I wanted to let you see in here for yourself. Okay, once again, it's off. There's no power. I'd like to know how the hell they do that. Got it. That's the same freaking orb. I gotta go over here and see if I can get it better. It's the craziest thing. <gasps> there it is. There it is. There it is. I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna zoom in. Okay. 
keep it rolling there. Oh man, what is that? No, nobody outside. And no clue what the heck's going on. But, oh well. <gasps> oh my god. What the fuck is that? Holy shit. Oh my god, what's it doing? Holy shit. Oh man. <sighs> Where the fuck did it go? Oh my god. I can't believe it. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Holy shit! Oh my god! Is it? I can't see it anymore. Where'd it go? I can't believe that. I can't believe what I just freaking saw. Oh my god! Oh my god! That's amazing. Oh my god, what? Message delete. Press 7, reply. Press 8, save. Press 9, more options. Press 0. Resave. Urgent message. I apologize for being so forward. It did not take us long to get your phone numbers. Our surveillance is mostly for passive monitoring, but it does come in handy. I cannot tell you who I am for safety reasons, but I can tell you that your perceptions of Stan Romanik and his experiences are real. As you have probably noticed, Stan is slightly different. The way he thinks, the way he perceives the world, seems to be a little more advanced than usual. The interesting thing is that Stan has no idea who he really is. Okay, Lisa, hit the button. One old message. Hello, Stan and Lisa. 
Your intention is not to scare or alarm you, but to warn you. It is great that you are back in Colorado, but Colorado Springs was not a good idea. It seems you have moved into their backyard. Now it is easy for them to get to you. I know how stubborn you are, Starseed. But please, heed this warning and know that we are in the children air at risk also. Now listen, Starseed. You know you are different. Follow your instincts and stay alert. This is too important. Soon it will all be revealed. And Starseed, do not be afraid of what you are. Like a mumbling. Something, yeah. Are you still there, Heidi? Yes, I am. What the hell is that? I don't know. That was really a nice sound. <laughs> you got it's making me feel weird. You hear that, Stan? Well, just stay on. How do you feel? Hello? 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 Heidi, I'm here. Did we lose him? Okay. Stan? Let me bring Stan back in, okay, Heidi? Okay. Hang on. Okay. Are you there, Heidi? Yeah. Okay. Hey, April, is Stan there? Um, yeah, he's on the floor. He passed out. Hello? Victoria. Yes. Please tell Starseed we are sorry. We did not mean to affect him that way. It is the option transition into the next step.
Ayan. One thing that I think strikes a lot of people, and it certainly did me when I met Stan, is he's just a normal guy. He's almost like a barometer, and uh, you know, and when things around him change, it really affects him. My first thought was that he was highly sensitive, highly aware, what I would uh, think of as the uh, artistic personality. Answered questions quickly, appropriately. I was impressed. He seemed like a normal guy, average person, nothing unique. They're a normal family. I mean, I saw their family life. They all seemed uh, very honest and very sincere and down to earth. So. He wears socks, he wears shorts, he wears shirts. You know, it's, it's not like an abductee is somebody who wears a tinfoil hat. They don't have moon boots. You know, he's very normal but he has abnormal things happening to him, around him, but more for him. You know, it's pushing him to do something very important, not only for himself, but in a way for humanity. Well, I grew up in a, uh, a military family and um, you know, we moved around quite a bit, not as much as most, but um, I had the added uh, discomfort of suffering from severe dyslexia. And in those days, they didn't know much about my learning disability. And they don't even think it's a learning disability anymore, but um, I was always put in classes with, you know, in special ed classes with the retarded kids. I remember I had a teacher make fun of me in front of the class and then grab me and throw me in a closet and lock me in a closet and said, this is where we put retards. Um, and yeah, it was terrifying. It was horrible. It was a horrible experience. And I had, you know, I had gang members around me all the time because of the neighborhood we lived in. I had the Crips on one side, the Bloods on the other, and they were constantly f fighting amongst themselves. And I was always 
and have stab wounds and stuff like that. I was always caught in the crossfires. And they used to pick on me a lot because number one, I was the only white kid. Number two, I had a learning disability. And I had to learn to fight because of it. Everybody beat me up and then I started beating everybody else up, including the principal of the high school I went to. So it wasn't good, I was kind of a punk. And just because I was, I was kind of angry at my life, you know, because of all the constant violence and all the, you know, having to deal with everything that I had to deal with, I was frustrated. Um, I calmed down somewhat and just kind of found my own way. When you look at that past, did it make you a better person? How did it help you? I honestly think certain people are chosen for certain things and I had to go through what I went through so I could understand the human condition. So the role that I play now, without that understanding, I couldn't do, I couldn't, you know, the message that I have, I couldn't give the message out correctly, I believe. You know, when I was growing up, my opinion of UFOs was, I thought people were crazy if they believed in that stuff. You know, I just didn't believe it. There was no reason to, I didn't even pay attention to it. I was in my own little world, my own little reality bubble, and that's the way it was. I was taught that there's nothing out there other than us. God made us and that's it. And so when this big event happened, it switched everything around. I first, I mean, it, it literally took me a good two years to come to terms with what had happened. And stuff continued to happen through that time. And what makes it so different is when the stuff happened, there were other people around. I wasn't by myself like a lot of these that you, you hear about. Um, most of the stuff that happens with me, even now, only happens with a lot of people around. So I, it, you know, took a lot to shake my tree, but when it shook, it shook violently and it changed everything. My first uh, official sighting happened December um, 27th of 2000. Um, I'd met my wife online. She lived in Nebraska. I lived in Colorado. I wanted her to come visit me. So I thought, you know, good way to do it. I was going to videotape the surrounding scenery and the skyline of Denver and, you know, send her a little care package with flowers and chocolate, stuff like that. Um, I decided to go the back way up to the mountains and, and there were cars pulled off to the side of the road. It must have been 20, 30 cars pulled off the side of the road. And all these people had gotten out and they were staring at something above the, the, power lines that were off to my left, or I would, I should say off to the south. And when I, as I was driving up, I'm looking at, trying to see what they were looking at. And it looked like some kind of weird silver hot air balloon. And I'm thinking, that thing's gonna crash into the damn power lines. And as I got closer, it's like, wow, isn't that the strangest hot air balloon ever? I got my video camera and started, you know, trying to, um, videotaped this thing. As soon as I rolled down my window, this thing acted like it noticed me somehow. And it was actually tilted forward and it was moving along the power lines and it reorientated itself and literally shot to about a thousand foot. Um, before that, it was maybe a hundred foot off the ground, just right above the power lines. And again, 30 foot diameter, this thing wasn't small. You know, I was fighting within myself, you know, is this, am I really seeing this? And if I am really seeing this, it has to be some kind of military thing, but how can the military have anything like this? You know, are they really that much more advanced and blah, 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 blah. And then I get a hold of Lisa, you know. I call her and I explain to her and I, I was upset. He called saying, you're not going to believe this. I, I don't know what this is, but turn on your web camera. I took the... Uh, camcorder and I put it on the screen and I put the camcorder up to the web camera so she could see it. I was very excited and he, he was convinced he was insane and I'm like this is so cool. And she believed in this stuff and I didn't so she kind of helped me calm down. I mean he was just so excited but scared you know it was just that little boy in him where it's like you're not going to believe this and yet it's like I don't believe this. This is too weird, this is too scary, this is, but this is really cool if this is what it is, 
you know, kind of a drama with him. It took a lot, a lot to convince me that anything like that was even remotely real. Two o'clock in the morning, maybe 2.30. And they must have been knocking for a while because I'm a heavy sleeper, but they knocked long enough that it woke me up. And I thought, first thing I thought is maybe my friend ran out of gas and he had to walk back. Maybe it was the neighbor, they were drunk. I wasn't sure. Got up to answer the door, and I noticed as I, you know, start walking down the hall, my sister had already answered the door. And I looked past my sister, and there were three people standing outside. The first thing that popped into my head is, oh my God, they're here to rob us. They're going to rob us. And I'm yelling at my sister, don't let them in, because they're going to rob us. And she's, as I get closer, I, I realize that she's, eyes are kind of, just slightly open mouth, just wide open, and she's staring at the ceiling like she's still asleep or something. And I'm yelling at her and she's not moving. And then when I get really close, I realize there's a female and two males. And I gotta tell you, I was really scared. I mean, I was really scared because I had just come to the realization that UFOs were probably real. But I didn't really think about the fact that something had to be driving these UFOs and that they might not be human. And then now I'm com being confronted with this reality that there's something at my door that isn't human. And let me tell you, it was really quite disturbing to me. And um, right as I got to that realization, the female stepped forward. And for whatever reason, I could hear myself screaming in my head, but I couldn't, it wasn't coming out. And she grabbed my wrist, a thought popped into my head. You're okay, it's gonna be okay. And the thought was not my thought. I didn't put that thought in there, it just appeared. And let me tell you, it must have freaked me out enough that I somehow snapped out of whatever trance they had me in, and there was a male on either, either side of me, and by the time we got outside to the balcony, I grabbed one of the males and I was gonna literally throw him off the balcony. And I felt the light tap, like somebody was tapping the back of my head, and I woke up somewhere else. It's really bright. Mm -hmm. Like really bright. Where's the brightness coming from? All around, really bright. I'm, I'm kind of stuck to a wall. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wall. I can't tell. Mm -hmm. What makes you think you're stuck to a wall? I can't move my arms. I can move my head. I can move my body. That's like I'm sucked mm -hmm. or glued to the wall. You know, you go to an amusement park and you those centrifugal force rides that spin around and you're stuck to, that's what it felt like to me. I could, but it was in, incredibly intense. Something around my wrist. I'm trying mm -hmm. to get free, I can't get free. Mm -hmm. And is it just around <clears throat> your left wrist? Um, yeah, it seems to be around my wrist, but I don't think that's what's holding me down. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's connected to something, but it's not mm -hmm. holding me down. I could move my hands, I could kind of move my hand, move my, my, my feet a little bit, but I could not get free of this wall. And when I looked, it looked like it had quarter-sized copper pieces about, uh, their space maybe a foot apart, all over the wall, just peppered the whole wall. And I had these copper bracelets on my ankles and on my wrists, and they had these tiny filaments, almost like hair-like filaments that were going to the wall. And if I wanted to, I could have snapped them, but for some reason, I, I was stuck, so I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. Well, they're turning me over. They're like turning me around, and I can't seem to move very much, and they're doing something to me. And they turned me around, and they started doing something my back that hurt, really stung really bad, like they were cutting me or something. They're sticking it really far in my back. Mm -hmm. How can you tell how far it's going in? It hurts. Mm -hmm. So you can feel it. Yeah, but it's weird is she puts her arm on me and then relax a little bit. And I felt another tap on the back of my head and I woke up in the middle of the room on a, some kind of platform with the female standing right there. And she looked at me, tilted her head, and suddenly an explosion of thought literally filled my head. It was so intense, it knocked me over, and I almost fell off the table. 
And uh, when I came, came out of this shock, she stepped back. She quit doing whatever it was that she was doing. She stepped back as if to say, okay, you poor, stupid, little, insignificant thing. We're going to try this your way. Image after image, thought after thought, visualization after visualization just filled my head. It was then that I realized whatever this thing was, it was way more advanced than me. He has that experience. He calls you up. What is that phone conversation? Phone call was basically, I had the weirdest dream. He said, but it doesn't make sense because I have, have all the hairs all off my wrists and I have these, these sores on my back. I was trying to be the analytical one, you know, it's like there has to be a reason for it. It can't be that aliens came in and abducted you. And he's like, well, I know it was a dream. It was a dream. Aliens aren't real. And then he called me back. Cause he's like, I'm, I'm going to go. And he called me back and he goes, it, it wasn't a dream. I know it wasn't a dream. I fell apart. I started crying and shaking and freaking out. It's like, oh my God, because it made it real. It made this whole thing real. This really happened to me. You know, when Deborah took me through the regressions, I started reliving all the pain. I started vividly remembering everything, every nuance, every sound, every painful experience, everything that happened. The most profound thing that happened to me was the part that um, I started writing down these symbols that I had stuck in my head. She asked me, so do you remember, what do you remember? I said, I have these symbols in my head. I have these weird things in my head. She goes, can you write them down? <laughs> she gave me a big pad of uh, paper <clears throat> and um, I think a marker. And I just start. I remember the symbols really clear. How do you, can you describe them? Oh, God, I could write them down for you. Okay. These are the images that, sh that I got in my head. My first abduction experience um, really was about, I think, seeing who I was, maybe seeing how I developed, I'm not sure. The abduction experiences after that seemed to involve reproductive stuff. They're really fascinated with our reproductive abilities and fa fascinated with our genetics for some reason. Or maybe they're manipulating our genetics. In my case, I think the latter is probably more true. Every time I'm up there, I'm up there with a woman, a human female. And um, usually it's the same one. Over the years, it's always been the same one. It's really bizarre. So are the two of you together or separately? We are together. We're together. Okay. And we're side by side and we're being led into this other vehicle or room. Or okay after they did whatever it was that they were doing, checking us out or whatever, um, they brought me and this woman into this room. And then what happens next as you're taken into that room? Um, we're just sitting there and then all these little kids, I don't know if they're kids, they're like little, they can look like kids. Mm -hmm. All these kids come up and the ladies like starting to wake up and she looks real happy and she starts hugging them mm -hmm. and then she looks at me and I look at her and then we're both really confused and mm -hmm. they're just these kids and they, they come is... hug my leg and hold my hand and there were seven seven children all, all together there were varying ages varying um, sizes varying you know some of them looked more human, some of them looked less human, some of them had hair, some of them didn't. Um, and I'm looking at these children and I'll never forget. Every single time, every single time I talk about this, th this one little girl 
comes up to me and hugs my leg. And I'm looking down at this little, this beautiful little child hugging my leg and I realized that this, this kid looks like me and she's beautiful, but she's different because it's all about the eyes. She has these huge, oversized, almond-shaped, slanted, so blue, they're almost violet eyes. Beautiful blonde hair, and she's just clinging onto my leg like, please, please don't let me go. I don't want to leave her behind. You don't want to leave who behind? The babies. The babies? What are you feeling right now besides the fact that you don't want to leave them? They're crying. They're crying? How do you, what tells you that they're crying? I can see them crying. They, they're reaching for me and they're making me go. Mm -hmm. The children are making you go? No. They're taking me away from them. Sam basically was reliving his experiences. It wasn't even about remembering. And to sit there and watch as he physically experienced the pain inflicted on him was very hard. It, it was just heartbreaking to watch. The memories he did have of his abductions and the woman that he, he remembered seeing her, he knew what she looked like, what she sounded like, was hard for me. But during these regressions, it all just came really, it became a reality for me. They kept looking at her and looking at her and Lisa watched me, you know, looking at her, she goes, you know, what's up? And I said, I know her from somewhere. I mean, I, I don't know where I know her, I know her from somewhere. And then it hit me like a lead balloon, like a ton of bricks. She was the woman I was with all this time, every time I was taken. It was the same woman. And we became very close friends. And it got to a point where it was kind of hard for Lisa because we had this weird connection me and Victoria, this bizarre, unnatural connection. I was so wrapped up in the, you know, the case and learning about it and learning what my role was in it and it, it experiencing so many things around me that I wasn't really, I wasn't focused on Lisa's feelings. When he found Victoria, that was really, really, really hard for me to deal with because I knew she was real, I knew she existed, and in some ways I prayed that he never found her. Because for... For six years, I worried. What would happen to me? As his wife. And then when it happened, all my fears started to like materialize. It was like this new courtship. It, it reminded me very much of when Stan and I met the hours of conversations and they had a connection via seven children that Stan and I didn't have. There were some instances where Stan and I would have a deep converse, be in a deep conversation and it's like she couldn't put a wedge through us because we were so focused on, on this scenario that we were involved in and trying to learn more about it. So I think there was, you know, there was jealousy, but it stemmed from probably just knowing that Stan had had experiences with this woman, me, up there. Victoria and I, I mean, we had some rough spots where my jealousy and my anger 
was very evident to anyone in that house. <laughs> We'd get together and the two of them would disappear and I would flip out. I mean, I would just be furious because when I voiced my concern, it's, oh, you're imagining it. It's like, don't put it off that I'm imagining anything. I see what's going on in my house and I'm not okay with it. I, I don't know how I would have acted, but she, she always held herself in complete poise in class. And I mean, there were a couple instances where she'd, you know, get, you know, you could tell she was hurt or bothered, especially if he and I would go off to the side and be in this deep conversation and she'd be looking for him and we're sitting out in the front yard talking. And then I started understanding, not liking it obviously, but understanding that here's these two people that were put together in these terrifying experiences. And they needed each other to, to figure out what had happened. I just wanted them to do it around everybody else, you know, not so closed off. So my jealousy wasn't like crazy and I wasn't worried constantly that tomorrow is the last day of my marriage. What she has gone through is such a difficult emotional path and she has been able to do it with grace and keeping her head on and keeping her marriage together. I have never doubted that my husband loves me more than anything else and he knows that you know obviously I'd give my life <laughs> to support him you know it's I would never lie for him, but I will support him. I'll back him up when he tells his story, when it's true, and the events are accurate. Otherwise, I call him out on it. It's like, no, that's not when it happened. So. Can I interrupt you for that? Mm -hmm. For a minute. You just said you would never lie for him. That's right, I won't. To your core, that's who you are. Absolutely. I've so nothing that has happened in any way, shape, or form in his life into you has been fabricated? No. Nothing, nothing that he has shared with you or anyone else is fabricated. I would not, I cannot tolerate liars. I cannot stand deception. I would if, if I thought Stan was lying about any of this, making any of it up, I would have walked away faster than anything. Love or no love, I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, he's not lying, uh, Stan, no. You, when you live with somebody and the person is undergoing trauma and the person, uh, uh, you know, has, he has physical contact. In other words, this isn't just downloading of aliens. This is physical marks and physical problems and physical uh, interaction. The person that's the closest to you uh, knows whether you're, you're, you're lying or not. And she is, actually, she and the family, all the family, um, know that this is a real phenomenon. Now, whether some of it has been done to him to confuse him and half of it is, is a disinformation or some of it is copycat, we don't know that but we know some of it is real. Do I believe everything that, you know, that's happened to him? Absolutely not, because I can't investigate everything that's happened to him. But I'll tell you what, out of all the things that he's claimed has happened to him, even if you believe 40%, that's a lot. That's enough right there, just that 40% is, is, is enough to, uh, you know, to, to believe that, you know, he's an actual abductee. This light just explodes onto the ground right next to the house and starts coming up towards where the video camera is bolted to the side of the house. And you see these what look like soap bubbles start flying around and it almost looked like there's a little bit of steam coming off the grass when the light hits the grass. And then pretty soon the, the video camera was taken out and I came back with a bloody nose and and blood and later that morning when um, I woke up 
um, I went to go check to see why the cameras didn't, uh, you know, why the cameras stopped working. Because we saw on the video, um, you know, this amazing event took place and the beam of light hit the ground next to the house. But it stopped working and I wanted to go see what the heck happened. So I went outside and I noticed this, it's as if where the beam of light hit the camera, it cleaned the whole area of sighting in this perfect like arc. And it literally melted the sighting. You could see where some kind of heat warped and kind of browned the sighting a little bit, especially up toward the camera. And it also killed the grass below. Now, when they analyzed the siding, it cleaned the siding somehow or pulled the dirt out of the siding all the way through the molecular structure of the siding itself. The very next day, I was going to collect a piece of siding um, because it was my day off and Lisa had to go to work early. And I woke up 8 o'clock in the morning because I heard this pounding. It's like, what in the world? I went outside to look and there were two guys had taken down my surveillance camera and laid it in the grass and they were replacing the siding of my house. I was pretty upset that they touched my surveillance camera and what the hell are they doing replacing the siding? I tried to get a hold of the landlord but the landlord was on vacation and um, I asked these guys, what the hell are you doing? Said, well, your landlord wants us to replace your siding so it's, I had no way to check right away so I let him do whatever. And I, I go, well, I, I want a piece of the siding. And I started rummaging through and they got really irate. They said, no, absolutely not. We got to keep every little piece of it because we got to prove to your landlord we, we replace the siding. I knew instantly that there was something fishy about that whole thing. Well, about a, not quite 40 minutes had passed and all of a sudden I heard a shop vac going. Well, I came running outside and they were shop vacuuming the yard and when they weren't looking I grabbed a piece of the siding. Even before then I went and got my video camera because I wanted to videotape the whole incident because I didn't trust what was going on. And it's weird because they wouldn't look at me. I got them to tell me what date it is and made small talk and they didn't even look at me to see that a video camera going. They just refused. They always had their back to me constantly trying to turn their back. And when I, I purposely walked around to face them they'd turn away. And so I grabbed a piece of siding, and after about 45 minutes, they shot back the yard. And I thought they went to lunch and were going to come back. They disappeared. It says Bob siding from Grand Island, Nebraska, on the side of their truck. And all they replaced is where the UFO beamed my surveillance camera. That's it. And when I called the landlord, the landlord said, I didn't ask for them to, to side the house. Why are they citing the house? I hope they don't charge me. So, and then the investigators looked up Bob citing from Grand Island and there's no such thing. No such thing. This weird British sounding voice left a message for us saying that it wasn't safe to live in Colorado Springs and you know, I thought somebody was joking around, but uh, honestly, I wished I would have listened because not long after that, um, I was riding my bicycle to work because I didn't live very far from uh, where I worked. And this black SUV kind of pulled up alongside of me as I was riding and I heard them say something. It's like, oh, great. You know, some militaries, some, some uh, military, t drunk military types trying to start trouble because there's a lot of uh, military bases in Colorado Springs. Well, I ignored them and kept riding. They were stopped behind a car at a stoplight, so I just went up and over an embankment and drove into the parking lot where I worked, and I was gonna go around the building to lock up my bike. Somehow these guys knew exactly where I parked my bike because they found a back way to get into the back parking lot um, where they cut me off. It was a guy on the passenger side gets out of the car and says, you need to keep your mouth shut. And I look at him, I said, I didn't say anything to you. And I knew these guys were going to start trouble. And you could tell they were definitely some kind of black, black ops or military just by the way they looked. He started shoving me and I kind of fell off my bike a little bit. And um, I heard him talking about the alien stuff and I said, 
I can't shut up about this stuff. This, that's ridiculous. And so he started swinging and we got into a tussle and you know, I grew up in Southwest Denver so I kind of know how to fight a little bit. And um, then the guy behind the passenger seat, there were four of them all together, got out and did all these kung fu karate kind of moves and I actually laughed at him. I think it kind of pissed him off a little bit. But he came at me and I had a bike chain wrapped around my seat that I locked my bike up with and I just started wailing at him. And I honestly thought I killed him because he was on the ground jerking around and shaking really hard like he was having convulsions or something. And I felt this intense kind of weird tickle pain thing on my lower back and I hit the ground. And this, as this was going on, people were driving by watching this happen. Somebody called the police. The police were there almost, oh geez, within five minutes of these guys picking up their buddy and throwing him in the van, their, their whatever SUV and taking off. Come to find out, they actually tased me. And that's why I fell to the ground. And um, one uh, person tried to follow them and lost them. So there was a police report made and ended up with a broken wrist and a broken nose. And you know, I wished I would have learned, listened to that, uh, to that call. This probably was the most significant event for me out of all of this that's happened so far. I'm still waiting for something more impressive to happen. It started out, I was painting the eve of my house and I had uh, grabbed for, I think it was for a brush to kind of brush the old paint off the eve and I, I kind of fell uh, off balance a little bit and literally fell 12 feet onto the ground and I tried to catch myself. Trouble was there was a wheelbarrow full of bricks just right beneath me and I twisted my leg just right and tore the anterior cruciate ligament in my hamstring of my right leg. Went to the doctor, they told me I was going to need surgery that next Wednesday. I think this happened I think it happened on a Friday, so I was going to need surgery that next Wednesday. I had to wait through the weekend and everything. Tuesday night, something happened though. Usually when I get taken, what will happen is uh, for whatever reason, whatever power or whatever technology they use seems to blow the circuit switches, blow, blow the breakers in the house. So um, Lisa woke up in the middle of the night because I was gone and all the breakers were blown. She could hear the breakers go or something. I don't remember exactly what woke her up. But when she tried to find me, I was completely missing. I was gone. I was nowhere to be found anywhere. She looked everywhere for me. She eventually got all the breakers flipped back on, all the lights back on, and she came in the house and I was standing dazed, kind of dazed in the middle of the living room. Now to me, I woke up and I was looking for Lisa. In reality, I was already missing and Lisa was looking for me. We didn't really give it any, any more thought. We didn't give it a, a second thought. And we decided, you know, we'll just go back to bed. You know, it could have been a fluke, who knows. Well, the next morning, Lisa, I couldn't work because of my knee, so I was off work. And Lisa had to get up fairly early to get ready for work. So six o'clock in the morning, she got up and she noticed this circle in my yard and it kind of looked like the same circle that we had in our yard from a prior abduction. Now what's interesting is Lisa woke me up to come look at this circle and she was looking at me weird and I walk up to the window and I'm looking I said that is this that's just crazy how'd that get there and Lisa goes do you notice anything different I go yeah there's a damn circle in our yard she goes, no, do you notice anything different? I'm looking at her like, well, what are you talking about? So she goes, come here. So I walk over to her and it's like, hey, where'd my knee brace go? Where'd my cast go? And how come my knee doesn't hurt anymore? And how come it's swollen anymore? And why in the hell do I have five holes on the back of my leg? 
there was hardly any bruising left. My knee felt, my leg felt a little stiff, but after a while it stretched out, and no pain, no pain whatsoever. Well, they found my knee brace a few hours later when the researchers came over on the side of the house, literally melted into some bricks, including the, the aluminum rods were all melted. And bits and pieces of it were found in the field behind our house and some of it on the swing set that was in our yard as if this thing was thrown out of some high place and it just landed on the side of our yard. Well, <laughs> the funny thing is I had to call the doctor to explain why I didn't need surgery. And I remember calling and I left a message for her and she called me back because she was off work. She called me back and she said, Stan, I understand you're really frightened about getting surgery, but if you don't get this surgery, you're going to be a cripple the rest of your life. You'll never be able to use that, that leg again. I said, look, I can't explain it, and I wasn't about to explain that I was taken by aliens and they fixed my leg. There's no way I'd say that to her. She'd think I was nuts. I said, I'm just going to have to prove to you I don't need surgery anymore. She goes, all right, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm not at the office right now, but my associate's in the emergency room. I'll call him, set it up. You go see him in the emergency room, and he'll tell you the same damn thing I told you. It's like, okay, fair enough. Well, I went to the emergency room, and my wife brought a tape recorder, and we recorded the whole conversation. And this guy had no idea how it was possible that I went from having a torn ACL to not having a torn ACL. And what kind of miraculous thing could have done this? At first, he said those holes in the back of my leg could be bug bites, but then there's no rivets in my, he didn't have any explanation. And then he said, suggested that we call the Ghostbusters to come figure out what was going on. And I never told him anything about the, the ET stuff, he just assumed. This video was pretty much um, the, the piece of evidence that put me on the map. It's also the one I get the most, um, what's the word, uh, the most crap for, basically. You know, the debunkers try to, and the skeptics just, well, pick that thing apart. How it originally started, um, I, I got married moved to Nebraska, um, and I was living in a town called Kearney, Nebraska. And I was um, watching TV and got up to get a drink of water when I noticed movement outside of one of the windows. And it's like, why the hell would somebody be looking in our window late at night? And then I, the first thing I thought was, oh my God, we got a peeping Tom trying to see my stepdaughter. This literally went on for months, a good three months, maybe four. Called the police, neighbors knew about it. It got so bad we set up little booby traps outside. And every time, um, you know, we heard a noise, we had a bat by the door and we'd run outside, but nothing, nothing. Uh, one day, one of the researchers said, hey, you've got a Sony Hi8 camcorder with a night shot on it. Next time you see movement out of one of the windows, put on it, grab your tripod, put on a tripod, point it toward that window and see what, see what you can catch. Well, it, it happened and I grabbed my camcorder and put the camera on the uh, tripod and pointed it toward that window. And I went to the bathroom. I was sitting at the edge of the bathtub reading a magazine because I really wanted to catch this guy. I wanted to give him a little time to look in the window. And I was reading the magazine and there were two flashes of light. And the, the second flash of light was so bright it almost blinded me and I had the door almost all the way shut. It's like, holy crap. So I looked and I kind of ducked back and then I kind of looked again. I see this head pop down and it's like, yes, I got him, I got him. Finally got the little son of a gun. And I went to go look out of the window um, to see if I could see this guy. And I saw what I thought was a small child running toward the backyard. Whatever it was, clipped the bush next to the house and stopped as if it 
heard me or something and slowly looked back at me. And what's interesting is I thought it was a full moon because I, could, I had a real good visual of this, this thing, whatever it is. And come to find out there was no full moon, so it might have been something else over our house that night. I was kind of staying away because my stepson had friends over for a sleepover. I didn't want him to get in trouble. And I woke up because I heard a noise. I had one eye open. And I'm sitting there going like this. And I see a naked figure run into my kitchen. I'm thinking, what in the heck is my stepson doing? I thought they, you know, his friends dared him to do something. And I was going to go find my camera uh, to blackmail him because I wanted to catch him on camera. I went upstairs and they were still asleep. I kind of woke one kid up opening the door, I said, I heard a noise, and then went back to sleep. Went back downstairs, made sure, you know, there was no, no, nobody messing around with me. I was just about to turn off the camera when I see this figure looking at me through the sliding glass door, blinking, moving. It's like, that's got to be some, somebody in a costume or some kind of puppet or something. I got closer, he closed his eyes slowly, and as if he was trying not to make a sudden move, he slowly just moved off to the left and disappeared. It's like, holy crap! So I'm looking outside to see if, you know, there's somebody holding like a puppet or something, and there's nothing. I went to the kitchen, and there were maybe three flashes of light that you can see reflecting off the, the windowsill of the kitchen. And I woke up on the ground 45 minutes later only remember seeing, remembering seeing the flashes of light. I didn't remember actually seeing the being in the window till I looked at the VCR. Well, we were um, having a party up at their home. And uh, it was a book signing party. The surprise party for Stan. One of the things that we try to do is make sure someone is with Stan at uh, all times so that if something does happen, if he sees something, that there's a, a witness there. It was raining outside and I was looking out the window, you know, being really grateful for the friends I had when I noticed this little girl at the edge of the driveway. Stan had seen the little girl outside and it was raining. He's like, come here Victoria, look at the little girls out here. And I'm like, Stan, it's probably just a neighbor kid. Just get in. It's I'm not going out there. It's raining. You know, and, and it was after that that I said, I will never not pay attention if Stan Romanek says, hey, look at this. This is unusual. I had my porch light on and it illuminated a, a, the yard up enough that I could see this little girl standing in a gray jumpsuit at the edge of the driveway. She had dripping wet hair and I'm thinking, it's 9 o'clock at night, it's raining, this girl's wearing a jumpsuit. What parent in their right mind would let their little daughter out in the rain like this? And why is she wearing a jumpsuit and why is she staring at me? I remember Stan going outside. He said he wanted to go outside for a little while. And it was kind of funny because then my friend Rick comes over and he goes, Where's Stan? And I said, he went outside. He's like, is he alone? And I said, yeah. He's like, oh, I better go. Damn it. Let me know whenever this happens. So I went outside immediately. I was looking for a flashlight. All I had was my camera, and I was using my camera as a flash because I wanted to see what this little girl wanted, and she ran away again. And it was by chance that I clicked the camera just in time to get a picture of her looking from behind a tree, looking out from behind a tree. And I was so dumbfounded and amazed by this picture. All I could do was sit there and stare at it. He had an odd look on his face, just dumbfounded. And I joked with him, I said, Hey Stan, how are you? Doing okay? He didn't respond, he just looked at me, stared at me. And I was speechless, I couldn't say anything. He goes, Stan, are you okay? And I just showed him the picture, he goes, Oh my God. You have to show everybody this picture. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. When we got back into the party, I told everybody, I want everybody to listen for a second. And I said, I need everybody's attention right now. Something appeared to have just happened outside. And I'd like every one of you to look at what's on the camera here. And her eyes were really large. They were very large, almond-shaped, human eyes, but very 
very large. It was more than a photograph. She was on top of that camera, emoting emotion. It was a moving moment. <laughs> Many people just started crying. They didn't. Uh, there was something so profound about what appeared may have just happened. So this was really strange, and we're all, you know, kind of freaking out about this. Everybody had taken a look. So I kept telling them, let's get this on the computer. Let's get this on the computer. Everybody said, go put it on your computer. Go put it on your computer so we could see it bigger. I took two steps down the stairs to go to my office. Beep. The pictures disappeared. We checked. It was off the camera, not there. The shots before it were there, shots after it were there. Every single person that was at that party saw it before it disappeared. And then he received a phone call. And then two minutes later, the phone rang, and somebody handed me the, the phone, and I, I answered it. It's Daddy, don't worry, I love you. I'm OK. I started just crying and crying and crying because I knew, I knew in my heart that it was. And then it all come flooding back. That little girl that was hug, hu hugging my leg was, was um, the girl that was there at the party. When I ran across his video of his first UFO sighting, I was really intrigued. Um, plus, I was part of MUFON, and I noticed that they had one of their investigators look into it. So really, I kind of, since it was some of the best video I had seen, wanted to look more into the veracity of the video. And I found that uh, it was very credible that the MUFON investigator had found there were several witnesses to some of his first sightings. When you only have a first-hand experience, only one person, and there's not really much you can do with that. That's not the issue. That was never the issue with Stan. There's just so much information out there. Um, it's, it's almost overwhelming. It, Stan's story is incredible also because it has so much proof. It has so much credibility. I mean, it, he has not only photographs, films, videos, he downloads formulas. He has it all in that story. That story is a gold mine for uh, uh, a, an example of, of perfect contact. There are aspects of the case that are very solid, that uh, it would be po impossible for Stan to hoax. Stan is being used to give a message also. I mean, he's being used to to say it's real. The stuff that I've seen, um, the evidence that I that I uh, that he has, that I looked at, and the, the people that I've interviewed around him, um, wow, yeah, he's a real deal, no doubt. My name is Claude Swanson. I'm a physicist, um, undergraduate degree in physics, MIT, class of '69. PhD in physics from Princeton, class of 76. I did uh, engineering consulting with the government through consulting companies for 20 or 30 years. What got me into physics was my real true love, which is what's called unified field theory, which is like the theory of everything. It's like the deepest questions of science, how things really work. For me, the enduring thing is that if you put together this particular set of equations, you'd have to know a lot about physics, okay? And from what I've seen of Stan, he doesn't. Um, you have to know a lot. And I, there aren't many people who know, who would be smart enough to be able to choose these particular equations and put them together. Um, most people would pick a random set of equations, you know, or they pick something that looks complicated, that maybe has no meaning to it. Um, these equations actually relate to propulsion and faster than light travel. I mean, I, I think one thing that they, they give is a sense of credibility to Stan. 
that these equations are beyond what he could come up with on his own, then they are an indication of a higher intelligence interacting with him. The more I have looked into them over the years and the more I've figured out different pieces of it, um, the more impressed I am that they seem to actually describe how they do some of the things that we, we find anomalous, how they go faster than light, how they get from some distant star to here. In our current science, even maybe 20 years ago, uh, those things were viewed as impossible. What's been happening in the past 15 years or so is there's a group of leading edge scientific thinkers who seem to be following along a similar path, who, um, and they're not the mainstream scientists, but there are more and more indications that seem to back up the equations that Stan has been writing. So there's a, a trend here, a, a growth that kind of says, you know, these might really work. Uh, one of his equations uh, relates to uh, a solution that was found in the 90s by a physicist named Alcubierre, um, a Mexican physicist, that is the first proposal for how you could take gravity and make faster than light travel from it. He found a solution, a mathematical solution, that gives you a, a warp drive. Okay, that's what they called it. Um, now, it involves, it involves some conditions uh, that are not realizable in our current physics today, but still it's a step in that direction. And as you look more into it, you find, and that's one of Stan's equations. And as you look into it, the other people put off, and, uh, and Robert Dickey, whose equations also show up in Stan's work, uh, they're also working on the same idea of how to change space-time in ways we didn't know was possible before. Right now, what I'm picking up is that there's a theme. And the theme is that it is possible to get from there to here. Our present conventional view is we couldn't have ET visitors because it takes too long for them to get from there to here at the speed of light or less. But suppose there are ways of warping space and time or going faster than light. And that's what some of these equations are, are hinting at. My first name is Stanislav. My middle name is Gergli. My last name is Ojak. I have a PhD in clinical psychology and I have a background in engineering, architecture and design, industrial design, and education, headmaster private school for gifted children. I administered with his agreement, with no one else around. His wife was in that building, as was my wife. It was a home of, of mutual friend. There are about five other people, and they're in the remainder of the house, and we use this office. The doors were closed, very private. I asked him a series of questions to determine, from my interpretation, his coherence, his intent. Is he there to bribe me uh, intellectually? Does he want me to set up some kind of an assessment or analysis to glorify who he is? I look at all those uh, issues. I gave him some documents. I said, okay, now I want you to take these tests and answer them as at whatever speed of mind. Don't worry about the length of time. You can, but you can't ask me any questions. And he said, okay. So he took the post-traumatic stress disorder assessment, and it shows that there's a very high degree of stress related to something. Now it could be related to his marriage. It could be related to uh, something he refers to as uh, a UFO experience. I gave him a personality test, which are called Myers-Briggs, in order to be able to understand his personality relative to himself and the way he answers questions. I also gave him one for his ability to recall things for memorization. I gave him one for um, interpretation in regards to lying. I outlined 27 different um, questions and how he answered them. And I watched what he did with every test because that's part of the assessment. How did he take it? Was he eager? Uh, was he frustrated? Uh, was he focused? Uh, 
Did he ever stop and lean back? Or did he ever hit the table? Many things that might show frustration. He did the, all five tests very calmly. And when it was all through, it took, as I recall, almost two hours. When it was all through, he said, I'm through. How am I? I said, you look okay to me. He said, me, I'm, I said, I haven't assessed the test yet. How can I ask that? It's okay. They look at him, tell me. I said, it'll take longer than that. Because yeah, I have to look at him carefully and do an assessment. He said, can you just tell me, am I crazy or not? Can you say that? I said, yes, I can tell you. From my perspective, you're sane as most people, if not more. You merely have had more exp experiences that confuse others more than they confuse you. And what I explained to him, norm is not something that we can all agree upon. So we have to have a norm which to agree upon. So if you're asking for my norm, are you normal? The answer is yes. If you ask many other people, the answer is no. In fact, they probably call you weird, a liar, and that things. I said, you do not lie, or you do not to me. Your experiences are real. I have a lot of proof for it. Therefore, you're okay. My name is Leo Sprinkle, R. Leo Sprinkle, PhD. I'm a counseling psychologist in the state of Wyoming. I teach self-hypnosis to people who wish to learn the techniques, not only to relax the body, but to focus the mind. So from a standpoint of uh, general mental health, these techniques are useful. Uh, some people may not like the word hypnosis, so if they don't like the word hypnosis, let's use meditation or daydreaming, uh, image rehearsal for athletes, uh, goofing off for teenagers. <laughs> uh, the task is to assist a person to recognize that within each person is more awareness, more knowledge than uh, he or she may consciously be aware of. So on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being insignificant, 10 being the most significant ever, where does Stan's... 9. Stan's case uh, is important from the standpoint of everyday people who want uh, something that they can put their hands on. There's a photograph, you know. Uh, here's a telephone call from an electronic voice that can't be traced. Here is an uh, equation that the physicists are uh, puzzling over. That kind of information means that Stan, as a person, doesn't have to be honest, doesn't have to be nice, uh, doesn't have to be uh, likable. He is nice and he is honest and he is likable, but he doesn't have to be because he's got all this information around him. He has been willing not only to share the photographs, the films, the phone messages, he's been willing to work with other people and write books uh, and to create uh, film so that not only his story, but the people who are with him, their stories are being documented and being shared. Uh, to me, it's part of the ongoing process. So my view is if a person has several sightings and then they have a job, they have a task, they have a duty, they have a chore. Uh, it may be merely to recognize it and accept it and talk about it with friends and family or it may be, be something beyond that. And so with Stan, the fact that he had already been willing to go through hypnosis, the fact that he had already been willing to talk about it and the fact that he had information beyond what most people have um, and that he's dyslexic. Uh, all of those things said to me that uh, he is uh, a messenger. And uh, so that's why I asked him when I was with uh, Alejandro and with him and Lisa, do you think of yourself as a messenger? And he said, no. <laughs> but as he talked with his wife and as he went on further, then he began to realize he may not think of himself as a messenger in the sense that he has a message, but it's just like when I was a 10-year-old kid, five o'clock in the morning, I'm riding my little bicycle and I'm delivering newspapers. I don't know the reporter, I don't know the editor, I don't know the publisher. I'm just delivering the news. I mean, he's delivering the news. probably a vehicle for some group or some race to give a positive message to the planet. But, you know, he's human. 
So we get all the human stuff and then we get all the starseed stuff together. And uh, he has a purpose, he has a mission. And I think his story is fascinating and I have recommended that, that this is the ongoing contactee case people should look at. Remember Paula Harris asked me some years ago, why don't you think people believe in UFOs or want to? And I don't because people have no place to put it in their mind. There's no reference. And it is a, of such importance or significance that it would force a person to reconsider all their foundational beliefs. Their beliefs about religion, who we are, what we are, why we're here. People aren't prepared to go through that mostly. It's much easier to go along with the herd and I've got plenty of things I want to do or have to do and I'm busy, busy, busy. It's amazing how many people witness unusual events and rationalize them and go about their daily routine. Um, it's our nature. It's the most comfortable thing to do. I mean, I think that there's a, a growing number of people who are taking an interest in the larger definition of who we are as human beings. Um, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who've had near-death experiences, who've been dead clinically on the table, the operating table, the heart operations, things like that. They've experienced the other side, as they would say. There's a uniformity in what they're reporting, that there is another side, there, that we are, they come back saying, uh, we are powerful spirits here in these physical bodies trying to have a human experience. There are these higher dimensions, okay, and we're all kind of learning and growing in these experiences. And a lot of what they say seems very consistent with the lessons that are coming out of these ET contact cases, trying to learn who we really are as human beings, um, to expand our own consciousness, our own understanding. Bottom line, even Stan, I think, understands this, that, that the group, and there's several groups visiting the planet, the group that he's involved with have some, some kind of spiritual message, uh, some kind of evolution of, of humanity that they want to happen. At the soul level, whee, this is big time. Because in my opinion, our souls are recognizing that this is a crucial time for humanity and for the planet. And so if we can bring ourselves at the human level to work together to collaborate, not only with ourselves, but with the ETs, and then I think it's, a, it's well worth it, and it'll be worth celebrating. Yeehaw. People always ask me, would you do this over again in a heartbeat? I would, in a heartbeat, because I've learned exponentially, and I get to look outside the box. His responsibility is to simply share his story, what he's experienced, and if it helps people who are in the same situation, that's very important to us. It's all about getting the message out. Every person, whether we are researcher, whether we're investigator, whether we are viewer, whether we are a contactee, or whether we're a fan or a foe of a contactee, each of us has our story and each of us uh, is unlocking inside. Why am I afraid of ETs or why do I love ETs or why do I wonder about humanity? Each of us has our own story. I have definitely gone from ignorant, you know, disconnected, frightened to enlightened. I have, that's what this is about. That's what my message is about. There's more stuff out there. And we, it's, it's time for the human race to grow up. It's time for the human race to know who they are. It's time for the human race to understand that there's more than just themselves. It's really easy, but it's very daunting. All we have to do, the human race, is understand that we're not alone and it changes everything. But trying to get thousands of years of, you know, uh, society um, ripped out of you is going to be tough because we've been taught these certain things through religion and through all this other all these other control mechanisms that we're supposed to think this certain way and it's not benefiting us at all and so you know the message is there's more out there and it's time we know it it's time to grow up and take responsibility for who we are
we're being asked to grow up and to be more in contact with the spiritual side of ourselves. And um, I mean, to me, that, that's what this whole process is about, is about growing up and, and taking on a more mature and a much larger view of who we are and how we fit into things. You know, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to help the human race. It's just, you know, I get lost sometimes. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or the wrong thing. I just try to wing it as best as I can. And, but really, when I realized my role in all this, I felt honored to be a part of it. And I still feel honored to be a part of it. And I pray every day that I can somehow make a difference in what happens to this wonderful race, this glorious race, because it's important. <laughs>